I don't know if you know this, both of them grew up on the mean streets of Chicago. Uh, the only way that they could survive was they joined a group of uh, extreme street ballerinas. <laughs> so that's how they made their living, you know, live on the mean streets of Chicago. But today, rather than um, pirouetting through Rather than pirouetting through Chicago, they are now pirouetting through the code. So I want to introduce all of them, and they're going to talk about securing your Rails application. Right? Yes. So everybody welcome, Jim and Matt. Thank you, Eric. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, I know it's early in the morning. <laughs> I hear the beer has already started flowing. Yeah. I'm taking advantage of that already. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. That's better. That's better. We are here to talk about securing the Rails application. And while Matt gets the uh, video set up there, I'll just ask. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how many people here uh, write in Rails applications? Leave your hand in the air if you feel that your Rails application is totally secure. Okay, we've got a lot of smart people here who realize that securing is a big issue. And um, I got interested in this a while back. Are we ready with the slides? Yes, here we go. I got interested in uh, this a while back by a fellow who wrote an article, Patrick Buchanzi took a look at the Osprey Rails code. If you're familiar with the Osprey, it is a Facebook replacement, and its emphasis is in privacy. It's designed to make sure that your private information is kept safe. So with that in mind, you'd think it would be a very secure Rails application. But as he looked at it, <laughs> he was struck by numerous severe security errors. And when all is said and done, it turns out because of coding mistakes that these people made in the Rails application, it was quite easy for someone to come in and hijack someone's account, and absolutely nothing, none of your private data was secured because the Rails app itself was not secure. That made me stop and think. I write a lot of Rails programs. How secure are my Rails applications? I've gone through all the standard. Uh, security classes. So I work at a big corporate environment where they made you go to these classes and you sat down and you learned about things like SQL injection and all, and all this. But I began to wonder, you know, is, is Rails that bad? And can we write secure Rails programs at all? I really began to get worried. I had the opportunity a couple weeks ago to pair with a guy <laughs> at our hack fest after uh, our Ruby, uh, Cincinnati Ruby Great meeting, and he said, Jim, would you pair with me? And I said, sure, what are you doing? He says, I'm writing code that monitors the power usage of uh, the chip on your car key, your, your clicker, fob, your fob, yes, thank you, your key fob that you open a car door with, that has encryption on it. He's monitoring the power levels on that chip and detecting what the password is by telling uh, watching the power fluctuations. It takes more power to flip bits than to not flip bits. So when the password is correct, he zeroes in the right password. You can see here, he's running a simulation here. He's actually figuring out that this 64-bit key is, you see up there right above the brink, dead beef uh, dude face and hex. Why do people do that? What an awesome thing to do, first of all. But who would ever think about monitoring the power on a chip to detect when the password is correct or not? And that, uh, you can see it's at a 0.96. That means he's 96% sure that is the right password. And the longer this program runs, the more certain it becomes what the password is. I don't think like a hacker. I would have never thought about doing things like this. So to put yourself, to, to get a secure Rails application, you need to think like a hacker. Okay. Um, so a little bit of reading homework here. Uh, we're going to be talking at a very high level about uh, various security concerns and, and, and 
uh, concepts related to writing serials applications and web applications in general. Uh, but we're not going to be, you know, we're not like, positing ourselves as security experts. Um, there's going to be, you know, you, 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 if you haven't read the Rails Guide on Security, um, read it, absolutely. It's, it's, a lot of the Rails Guides are very high quality. Uh, and the Security Guide is, is one of the best. And there's plenty of uh, really great information, a lot of which, um, you know, the, the things that we touch on are going to be discussed in, in more depth uh, here. As well as um, what this Security Guide was pulled from was a paper. It's uh, 48 pages long, not too long. Um, this should be required reading. Uh, written by uh, Keiko Weber's for um, OWASP, uh, which is the uh, Open Web Application uh, Security Project. Um, also a great you know, site and organization to become a member of if you want to, um, to support uh, and play of information, you know, the authoritative source, authoritative source for uh, web application security. Okay. That says 48 pages is really long, but it's really dense 48 pages. <coughs> so yeah, it takes a while to work through all that. Um, we have an OWASP guy come and speak to one of our local user groups, and it's really interesting whenever he does. Let me give you some of the basics here about Rails security. Here's an architecture for your typical web application. You've got a server, you've got a browser, and you've got a database. Of these three things, what do you trust? None of them. None of them is a good answer. In particular, you can't trust the browser because you don't own the browser. That sits on the desk of the user, and he can do anything he wants on that. So you can't trust anything that comes from the browser. You can't trust the database. Because even though you think you have control of whatever goes into the database, a lot of the stuff in the database is user input. And there are sneaky ways of doing input that might sneak past your security measures. So don't think just because it's in the database is something that can be trusted. The Rails server itself, if someone's gone in and corrupted your Rails program, you've got bigger problems than what we're going to address here. So we're going to concentrate mainly on browser issues and database issues off. That's not to say that there aren't security issues around the server itself. They are more related to admin issues. So let's talk about the very first issue, SQL injection. How many people have ever heard of SQL injection? Okay, very well. This is the common one. Everybody covers this in your basic security programs. So let's suppose we have a little uh, controller method that looks like this. This goes in and it wants to find users who have a name like some kind of uh, filter text in there, it matches the filter text, and uh, who's not an admin. So there's a little bit, of, little bit of SQL in there. And notice this. What's wrong with this right here? It's not escape. You are putting filter text, which presumably comes from a user, right into the text of your SQL query. And if you're not careful, that is a big, big security hole. Um, let's, let's demonstrate that, Matt. Sure. We'll go and take a crack at this one. Uh, <laughs> Matt, Matt is my local hacker. Yes, <laughs> Not exactly, but for the purpose of this talk, yes. So um, we have here a very simple um, example app. And it's, of course, it's very dark, unfortunately. But it's written um, to schedule movie nights with your friends. Right? So you get together, and you watch movies, and you have beer, and what have you. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, we inject, we put in this extra little page here, which gives us um, access to certain things uh, to, to make examples out of it. We see here a list of users that are in the system, right? And now we've got uh, four users that uh, have signed up. It's very edge case centric uh, user base at this point. Uh, but if we click, um, we like our movie. That's true. If we we have minutes, we can see that there's one administrator of the site, which is uh, Joe O'Brien, who happens to be our boss. So, um, even though there's only four users here, perhaps that's just too overwhelming for me, so there's an opportunity I can go and, and filter this a little further down. So I'm going to filter by, by Jerry. And that, okay, now the only users being shown is Jerry, who's our designer and a great guy. But if we can go up and look in the, um, uh, into the, the uh, URL, uh, we see that uh, we've got a query parameter, filter equal Jerry, um, as being our uh, is, is the way that filtering is being done, which tells us that we may have an opportunity here to, uh, to do some, some injection. Uh, so I'm going to copy something for a uh, cheat a little bit. But let's say I, I'll, I'll say, um, uh, let's test that out and see if, um, if that's the case. Um, you, you need 
comment from Ashton in about this. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Uh, so now, the filtering, you can see they're coming back. Instead of just uh, plain users, you can see they're now getting the administrator. Right? Because what, what have we done? We've, um, by injecting this one equal one, it's going to match on every possible user. And tossing in the comment, uh, it's going to comment out the remainder of the, the SQL that we've written, which was doing the not an admin check. So now we can get everyone back. Uh, and that's, you know, that's basic SQL injection, right? We've seen that before. It's not, not terrifying. If we change that up a little bit with something that looks a little bit more complex, um, this long string here, and run it this time, uh, we're getting back um, the administrator. And in this case, what we would be seeing is uh, his encrypted password, but apparently two, two twice in a row. At the, uh, screw that demo, unfortunately. Well, what we're doing, yeah. kind of love live code demos. Um, actually, there is a string that we got working at least one point in time uh, that uh, we could actually dump the encrypted administrator passwords by putting in enough, uh, you know, unions on the SQL tables. Once you got SQL injection, your entire database is open for browsing. Essentially, you can put any SQL in there. Essentially, pull anything out with a complex enough uh, string. So you want to pick the play again for a sort of thing. Okay, so but basically you expect to see something like that, but what a hacker will do will uh, put code like this into your SQL that essentially comments out the rest of it and can act can totally control your database at that point. The fix for this is to use what Rails gives you for building up SQL queries. Use the question mark like this and put the text that you want to filter on separately. When you do this, Rails will escape that text. Make sure any quote characters are properly quoted themselves. Make sure comment characters won't hurt your SQL queries. And it just works. So use the built-in facilities. Now, you see I'm no longer showing up with your users. 
And if I click view admins, I'm now enabling a self administrator. Okay, that's hacking on the mass assignment bug, uh, not bug, but a uh, feature of, of Rails. What you want to do to prevent this is something along this line. You can declare on your user model what fields are not allowed in mass assignment. What fields should not be included in a mass assignment. And, uh, and there's two ways to do it. You can create a whitelist like this, where you say everything that's allowed to be changed. Or you can create a blacklist like this and say everything that should not be changed. Quick survey, which is better? Whitelist or, how many say whitelist? Let me say blacklist. Okay, you're right. The whitelist is better from a security standpoint because if you forget a field, uh, it'll be obvious that you can't edit it. However, if you create a blacklist and forget a field, it's very easy to miss the fact that someone can start injecting uh, new parameters. Okay, so whitelist, prefer a whitelist. You were going to talk about leaking work. I'll talk about leaking because I know plenty about it. I'm not going to finish that sentence. Anyway, leaking information. Uh, so this is a little bit more subtle topic. Um, you know, not necessarily a lot of prescriptions about this, but uh, just to talk briefly about it. Uh, timing attacks fall into this category, and, and what, what the timing attacks. Uh, basically, any time that um, a malicious user can, well, potentially malicious user, can gather uh, statistical data about um, the, the timing behavior of your application and clean some and some information from that. So let's take, for example, that we've got some sort of uh, compare, uh, compare digest uh, method, and, what that, and we're using that uh, to check our, our session key that's being stored in a cookie, for example, um, against the expected value um, to do authentication, right? And it's just doing a simple comparison, a uh, string comparison in this case. Uh, so what's that going to do? Well, the first sign that it sees that uh, two strings are not equal, um, you know, if you have ABC and, and ABQ, well, um, at the point we hit Q, we know that they're not equal, so it's going to return a false, right? Basically fail at that point. So what if we have, um, you know, a session uh, key that looks something like this, right? You know, a random hash. Um, and then I decide to, to generate sort of um, a set of input, potential inputs that I think might match this key. Uh, and so first I try, you know, 0, 0, 0. 1, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, so on. And then I try B, 0, 0, 0. Anyway. And I, but I noticed that with, uh, with this one, that the, um, the response, that the, the time it takes to get a response back takes just a little bit longer. Um, and it makes a, you know, a statistically significant difference. And so now I've determined that, okay, now, well, now I've got the first byte, right? Um, and you can, you can continue that process um, and march your way through um, using uh, statistical analysis and it might seem like, well, that's either very slow or that's an unlikely uh, scenario, but the reality is, you know, space out of a series of, of a few days um, with a relatively um, small and probably undetected uh, number of requests, you can uh, determine that sort of, you know, some information and actually detect and spoof the session value. Uh, for, a lot, uh, for a nice blog article that uh, talks more about this and, and some practical implications, uh, Code Hale is a, a, a great article, Less in the Time to Attacks. And then one other thing that's, that uh, could fall into this category, uh, text social network authentication status. So if, you're, if I'm logged into Facebook, say, um, then uh, if, I, if, if, an, if another user puts on their web page a link to some image that they know on Facebook, um, that will resolve properly for a logged in user, but will not for a non-logged in user. Uh, using some JavaScript, for example, what we're based off of either you know, the amount of time that it takes to, uh, to re request that, get the result of the image request down, or um, the actual HTTP response code, if it's, if it's a RESTful um, uh, service, for example. Um, you can use that to detect whether or not another user uh, on your site is logged into, say, Twitter or Facebook, what have you. What can you do with that information is particularly useful or malicious. I, I don't know, but it's the kind of information that you can you know, uh, pull down based off of um, this sort of information leakage. And there's not really much you can do about that latter, uh, latter issue. Cross-site scripting, another uh, big issue. Okay, so we're talking about the, the browser and the database here in this particular attack. And this is an attack where the user is able to get malicious information into your database. Let's demo this one. Uh -oh. Back on the job with my leap hack source skills, which involves a lot of copying and pasting. Okay, so now we're actually going to exercise this app. So the point of the application is to uh, create 
Schedule movie nice to be friends, right? So I'll go ahead and schedule this new movie. And we'll hold it at Bat Cave. Um, yes, people should bring drinks. Uh, and, and notes, right? So maybe I want to say, um, you know, bring pizza. And that should be important. So I might want to be able to do something like this and say strong, right? Oh, and as the designer of this application, I might want to allow users the ability to, to do you know, some markup in, in their, their fields and their messages, right? And, and that, you know, it's a, it's a nice user experience in some ways, so. But uh, instead of, say, um, using a bold tag, I use something different. Try this. I wonder if this is going to work. Yeah, I got to schedule the night. Oh, yeah, it does. All right. So that's, yeah, that's really in your face. There's no way my, my friends are going to forget to bring pizza if I have that nice pop up uh, window, right? So that should be good. Um, and that's kind of annoying. That's an obnoxious thing to be able to do. But could you maybe do something that's a little bit more, um, a little bit more dangerous? Uh, and, if, and, and the answer is potentially yes. Uh, so if I could schedule something else, and this time we'll have it at the old mansion down the street, um, and use uh, a little bit more complex piece of JavaScript in this case. So what do we have here? So here we're saying document.write, and then we're writing in an image tag. Okay? And that image is pointing to, in this case, it's pointing to localhost on every port, but you know, it's pointing to you know, you know, hacked at some you know, .some malicious site.com. Um, and into that, it's also writing uh, the, the document.cookie. So it's writing the cookie value to a string. Uh, appending it to the end of this. Um, so, well, what's the result when I go to save that? All I see is a broken image, right? Right here. It just winds up being an image tag, because obviously you know, that is not pointing to a valid, uh, not pointing to a valid image on the server. But if I run over here and just check the logs for, you know, all, all I did in this case was generate a new Rails app uh, and start it off running. Um, you can see that in now in the uh, in the log for this this uh, third-party malicious application, we now see all the cookie data, uh, including session data that uh, you know I had uh, as as authenticated to a different site. Uh, and obviously that's a problem. And of course, in this case, um, it should be noted that uh, we did subvert. Um, you know, a security measure that Rails puts in place, which is to mark cookies, uh, the session cookies HTTP only, so it can't be manipulated by JavaScript. So I guess the take on there is don't do that. Um, but nevertheless, it illustrates the kind of thing that uh, we kind of should pick them up. Once the user has the ability to put JavaScript on your site that's under their control, they can do a lot of bad things. Grabbing cookies is just one particular thing. Um, when we get to, uh, what is it, cross-site? Uh, request forgery. Yeah, the, the forgery request. We'll see another example where running JavaScript can, can be a piece that leads to bad things. The key to this is that they put JavaScript on your page. You saw just a um, image tag that was broken. But what that did, that sent off a request to an external server that was under their control that logged the session data. That session data is the key to all of your information on that site. Once they have a session key, they can log in as you and they can uh, do anything on that site in your name. So protecting that session key is very, very important. This happened because in that notes section here, we had the raw tag. A raw allows all the user in input to go, uh, everything in this nice dot notes thing to go directly to the web page without any kind of filtering. Now, to, by default, Rails used to do this all the time. To prevent that, we put the H command in our uh, tag, in our views. Uh, new Rails, Rails 3 does it by default. It filters our data by default, and if you want the old behavior, you have to put raw in. But if you want the ability for the user to put bold tags or strong tags or, or block quotes or anything like that, you need to allow something like raw to happen. So yeah, you might want to use textile or markdown. Um, so what do you do? Well, don't use raw. You recommend not using that. Uh, don't use raw with anything that comes from the user. If it's generated entirely by you, that's, that's a little bit better. But don't use raw on 
on uh, user input. Uh, don't use a blacklist and don't try to correct. For example, here's an example of someone who tries to correct user input to make it safe. He says, well, we'll just remove any script tags from that input and that will sanitize it until the user enters this. Yeah, so don't try to correct. If the input is bad, reject it. Don't correct it. Beware of JavaScript in unexpected places. For example, uh, you might expect it in an href tag. That's not unusual. But uh, as the background on a table, you might not think to check there for unusual JavaScript. So probably what you want to do is a Rails uh, method called sanitize. It actually will go through a white list of tags you want to allow. And we'll let those tags through and we'll prevent other tags from going there. And sanitize is pretty well written. I recommend using it rather than try to write your own white lister. Um, because they probably did a better job than what you would have been able to do. Okay, real life uh, cross-site scripting incidents here. Uh, 34,000 names and passwords were stolen from MySpace using this. Uh, what they did, they used uh, cross-site scripting to hide the content and presented a fake login screen. Ingenious, yes. And that was in 2006, so it is a big problem. Let's talk a little bit about privilege escalation. This is another thing that I uh, am prone to do in my code that I, I am learning to change. Here we have a find command where we're finding the knights that uh, are attached to a particular user. Or, excuse, yes finding the knights based upon this knight ID, and it should be restricted to the knights that a user is allowed to see. However, we're use, again, we're using params that comes from a form, which comes from the browser, which is unsecure. So uh, let's demo this one. Okay, so we'll do a, a, a simple deal here real quick. Um, you know, I'm logged in as, as myself in my account here, and I can see my schedule of upcoming nights. Um, if I logged out for a second and log back as Jim, because he was kind enough to give me his very uh, complex password for this site. Um, and I noticed that he's got a couple of upcoming movies. Um, we can see that real quick. Um, including one that looks like I might want to go to, but a note that I've not been invited. He invited Joe, he invited Kim, he didn't invite me, which hurts my feelings. Um, but that's, you know, that's just the way it goes. So, so, so which one were you interested in? Star Wars or the Ninja Turtles? Well, if it were me, I would want to see... Well, actually, I'm torn. But I, I, would, <laughs> I, would, want to see, uh, I would want to see Star Wars, I think. Um, but technically, I'm not invited. But what could I do? Um, I could have noted that even though I'm not invited this night, I know the... And you're, you're logged back in as yourself. I'm currently logged in as myself here. So. Uh, but here I am viewing this movie of, of, of gems that I happen to not be invited to. And not being invited, I really shouldn't, uh, probably shouldn't be allowed to vote, I shouldn't be allowed to see this, right? But, um, you know, maliciously, since my feelings are hurt, I'm going to vote and make them try to watch Ninja Turtles instead of Star Wars or Blade Runner, which are obviously more awesome. Although, frankly, they're all awesome movies. But I'll, I'll go ahead and vote. Um, and we'll see that, okay. So, I got to weigh in and make a decision on this movie, even though technically I'm not invited. So that, that seems like that should not be. Yeah, you notice he did that by hacking the URL. He just put in the ID of the night and we went and fetched it. Um, the problem with this search is that it doesn't limit the number of the nights that you're allowed to see by the current user. There's no current user involved in this. And there's a very simple way to fix this. Instead of doing a not that night not find, go to the current user, ask for his nights, and then find based upon that. And this search, oops, this search will limit you to only nights owned by the current user. That will restrict the number of nights you see. Now, I tend not to do this in my code. Uh, and it's a habit I've formed over the years because I don't particularly like to do a find on the associations. I like to treat associations as kind of just objects. And the fact that it's active record based, I, I try to ignore that in my code. 
so I will probably not, I not do this, but since it's actually safer, the other way of doing it, this is a better way to go. So I'm changing my code habits because of this. Would you say you were doing that previously for testability reasons? Uh, just uh, <coughs> kind of abstraction reasons. I like to treat my, my models as objects and only deal with the fact that they're active records at particular points in my code. I don't like to f spread the fact that this is an active record object all over my code base. So I tend to limit the points where I actually do saves and uh, finds and things. Okay, cross-site request forgery. Now this one was a new one for me when I started researching this topic. I always knew that Rails did something about this, but I didn't understand what it was or what they did and how it fixed it. But this is actually a very fascinating one. This is a scenario. You're sitting at your browser and uh, you visit a hacker's web page, <coughs> conveniently labeled so you know it's a hacker, actually probably not, and you bring data down into your browser and it's an image that references movienight.com night slash one destroy. That is an image request the browser then sends out to the movie night website and since you are already logged into the movie website, your session data is still in the cookie in your browser. So you have permission to log in and do anything, and the destroy command runs out there and deletes your movie night. Okay, there's a couple counters. That, uh, were we going to demo this one? Yeah, yeah. we can do it then real quick. It'll be just a moment. Plus, I'd, I'd like to show off my awesome design skills to the door and unsuspected tools. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back here and check my schedule, I can see I've got several uh, movies coming up, including uh, going to go see Blade Runner, we're going to do a Blade Runner. Um, apparently I haven't invited anyone, so I'm just going to have an awesome time by myself uh, watching Blade Runner. Um, and and that's, that's number 12. With the nice that is number 12. Okay. And if uh, we know that I'm logged in, let's say you know, some other link comes along, someone sends me an awesome email, I, I don't know exactly where this comes from, but I get directed to this page. <laughs> and I cannot possibly resist the chance to click for epic win. Um, you know, that's just ir entirely irresistible. So I'm going to click here on this button. And it's going to tell me what I'm going to send it, which is hilarious. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Good catch. <clears throat> Let's try that again. And now I'll click for epic one. There we go. Hmm, hope you went to leap later tonight. Well, no, I didn't. That was not the epic one I was looking for. Um, and yeah, I brought it home itself. So, and, and, and how was that done? It was very simple. It's just inspect this element. You see that when we click on that uh, image, it's just a form. And the form was pointing to movie night local slash night slash twelve the method post um, and an input uh, of delete right so it's just taking advantage of the Rails restful structure there. Can you do that with just jQuery? Without the user ever having to click on something? Um, yeah, I mean you could right if you trigger anything you want to trigger a form selection as long as you know, in this case we're making a conceit and that we we know this ID that we can. You know, which, of course, that in itself would be difficult to know, but there was to it. But yeah, you, you, as long as you turn a form out of post. Okay, counters to that. Be RESTful. In other words, don't use GET to uh, modify the database. This is a basic Rails convention anyway, so if you follow it, you're somewhat safe, but that won't prevent you from a um, more sophisticated attack. Uh, similar to what Matt did here, we're using the POST method to actually get in there. What Rails does is in every form that you generate in a Rails application it has this strange thing called an authentic, authenticity token that has a really long hash value that's a key. And that is in every form. So when you send a form to your website, Rails will check for that token. And if it's not there, it will fail. So a cross-site cross request forgery uh, won't have that key in the form. So it can't forge that and pass it over. However, if uh, you have cross-site scripting, in other words, they got 
uh, JavaScript loaded onto one of your movie night pages. They could detect that and uh, they could find your token and use that as well. So, so these things kind of cross-pollinate and, and are synergistic together. Session spoofing. I'll let you talk about this. Okay, one. and I'll talk a little bit about session spoofing. So who remembers this one? Uh, Fire shoot, right? I'm particularly proud of this image. Um, so Fire Street was kind of a big deal, right? It was, uh, it made, it was for the first time, it was incredibly simple and straightforward to exploit a, a long-known you know, uh, vulnerability in, in web applications. Um, but you could simply install a browser plugin and um, view and, and spoof the, these sessions of popular social media sites of those around you. It worked based off being on an open network and open Wi-Fi, so unencrypted Wi-Fi, right? Um, so I could do a demo of that here. And would anyone, would, you know, am I going to capture anyone's session? No, I'm, I'm not going to do the demo. But, um, but uh, you know, basically, how, how can you work around this? Um, because it was taking advantage of the fact that it was unencrypted uh, network traffic and, and uh, having, turning a, your, your network card to, into a promiscuous mode. It would capture um, ongoing you know, traffic from a browser to a, a third party site and scoop the session information out of it and then just submit that uh, session info as your own, right? Right, Writing uh, on top of the already active session. So how can you get around that? How can we as web developers and, and the creators of websites um, prevent this? One, require SSL. You know, it's 2011, um, that time has come. Um, uh, use secure cookies. Um, you know, so by default, um, you know, one thing you can do with cookies, you can mark them, I mentioned earlier, you can mark them as HTTP only, so they can't be manipulated through JavaScript. Um, by default, they will be passed across either an HTTP or an HTTPS connection. You can mark cookies as secure, so they only be put, um, pushed uh, up, to the, up to the server um, on HTTPS connections. And for session cookies in particular, that's a great thing. Um, something else that's uh, an, an upcoming, um, I believe it's going to be an upcoming emerging standard, uh, strict transport security, it's a, it's a new HTTP header um, that's currently in the draft that um, a server can actually direct browsers and clients that um, they must operate uh, over TLS or SSL um, to communicate with that server. Uh, so that's the, you know, at the protocol level, which would be nice. Um, one way to quickly enable all of those things, um, the, the drop-in is uh, there's Rack SSL written by Josh Peake um, that you can just use as a Rack middleware and uh, will automatically uh, you know, force SSL, uh, will mark cookies as secure, uh, and include that, um, you know, the, the emerging header. Um, I think just within the last couple of weeks, we saw um, Twitter finally uh, enabled an option, it's still off by default, but now there's an option. Uh, you can go to your account and, and force um, all connections over SSL. Um, GitHub a while back, um, this was entirely over, over uh, HTTPS, which is a good thing. Um, Gmail, uh, quite a long time ago, um, went uh, entirely SSL or Google Apps. And there's a white paper that uh, I don't think we have a link to in here, but uh, you can put one in maybe before we post the slides. Uh, Google published a white paper a while back, basically claiming that uh, you know the energy and the cost um, impact of, of enabling SSL uh, across the board was uh, you know, was negligible with respect to the you know, the potential cost of a security breach. Um, so kind of the myth of, uh, for the most part, the, uh, the, the, the notion that uh, SSL is too much of an overhead, either you know, computationally or what have you, is kind of a uh, thing of the past. So. Okay, let, let's summarize here. I want to state up front that um, when I started this talk, I thought I would find all kinds of problems in Rails. And it turns out they exist but we had to do a number of things to enable them in this particular web application. We had to turn off uh, Rails protection against sending cookies to JavaScript. We had to bypass the, um, the raw uh, filtering that Rails does naturally now. So Rails, by default, will do a lot of these things for you. There's just a couple coding things that you have to be mindful of. In summary, trust nothing. Don't. Uh, don't assume that the user is uh, on your side because he could not, be, he might not be. Um, stand to data security patches. Get the latest patches for Rails because they constantly fix things as they find holes. And if you're on a back rev, uh, you're probably missing some security issues there. There is a Rails security mailing list 
And if you're not on it, um, you should be. Uh, don't bypass the things that we had to bypass to do a lot of these demos. Uh, always scope your finds by the proper user to make sure you only find things that are permitted. Uh, avoid using raw or use a whitelist to sanitize your output. Here's a good one. Do a security audit. Um, we had an outside firm do a audit of a couple of our programs and it was very enlightening and very worthwhile. Find a firm that knows what they're doing and ask them to look over your code base. And finally, just be aware. You and I probably don't, I know I don't, don't think like a hacker. But put yourself in that mindset and think of sneaky things that could be done and just be proactive about that. I think we're out of time. We've got 30 seconds, maybe one question. Do that. Do that, yes. Did you guys look at the OWASP SAPI project and compare what that does to measures in Rails right now? I, I've not looked at that, have you? Um, I haven't, I, I, I'm aware of it, but I've not actually um, run it, so. So, uh, would you recommend doing so? Well, I've always been curious. I, you know, I don't know enough myself to really compare and know yeah. where the holes are between them. Yeah, yeah, so other related to something we, we don't mention probably should is that you know, there, there are automated um, tools that can detect some of these common faults, and there, there's several of them out there. They'll basically crawl your site and look for places they can inject um, SQL, inject JavaScript, and, and can be reported. So I, I think when we did the security audit, that's not a problem we did. Yeah, well, I know, yeah, yes. Yeah. So. Okay, well, thank you very much.